I am moderating uh, this session. I'm not uh, presenting, so I'm just going to very briefly uh, present the panel. Um, this panel, uh, the case study is on the Great Lakes, and the panelists will present uh, challenges and large-scale visionary proposals for the Great Lakes region, and I would say that two of the largest challenges uh, in relation to the Great Lakes region is that on the one hand, the environmental crisis might seem to be uh, invisible against the backdrop of the incredible abundance, and certainly when we talk about things like conservation uh, in relation to the Great Lakes, uh, it's, it's difficult to see, you know. It's, uh, as I said, it's hidden behind this kind of perception of abundance. It's the opposite condition of what's perhaps happening in California. Uh, and so the question is how, how we make that uh, visible. Um, and I, I think the other is the massive uh, scale of the region and the complexity of its constituents, uh, even though after looking at the LA region, uh, the, just the sheer complexity of that I think is daunting. Uh, the three, uh, the three um, or four panelists, uh, Henry Henderson will start, he's the Midwest Director of the Natural Resources Defense Council, and we'll talk about uh, large uh, scale infrastructural efforts uh, within Chicago. Uh, Pete uh, Mulvaney uh, will follow, he leads the Sustainable Water Research, uh, Resource Strategies in Chicago. Uh, from the offices of SOM, um, and uh, I should say, I had asked uh, each of the panelists, we do have a kind of multidisciplinary panel, uh, Henry's background, uh, he's a lawyer, uh, Pete, uh, an environmental engineer, and then following Pete will be uh, Jen Magret and Maria Arquero uh, de Alarcon, uh, who are partners of MADE Studio, uh, coming from the realm of architecture and design. Uh, they are also um, both professors at uh, the University of Michigan uh, School of Architecture, College of Architecture. Uh, and they're a research-based design practice uh, that uses data and geographic analysis and visualization to make vivid the complexity of the constructed environments. And they'll talk about uh, projects both in the Great Lakes uh, region and liquid planning in Detroit and I will leave it off there for our panelists. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, address this, uh, the, this discussion. Um, I, I think that the previous discussions about the, the development of tools to actually understand, analyze, and create opportunities on the way forward for um, sustainable use of water is absolutely critical. I thought the political discussion at the end is remarkably uh, like what is happening in many, many uh, communities throughout uh, the United States. Uh, we have some different uh, issues with regard to uh, the, the persistent drought issue in the West and uh, what we have uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, we also have different uh, legal systems that constrain and control how we think about and how we can address the issues. East of the Mississippi, we have the assumption of abundance of water. Uh, the big problem with water is too much water, and that's how our institutions are basically set up to manage the situation. Uh, the fact is, is that we are entering into an entirely different reality with regard to these, these given assumptions of either um, regular access to water, uh, too much or too little. We have been whipsawed in the Midwest going from uh, drought to uh, over overabundance and, and serious flooding. We've had within the Mississippi River, for instance, one of the great watersheds of, uh, of the world, uh, within months of each other, so much water that the uh, levees have had to be dynamited in order not to sweep towns away, followed rapidly by so little water that the Corps of Engineers has had to explode the bottom of the river in order to let a small amount of, of, of goods move by, by barge. Uh, last year in, in January, it was $7 billion increased cost to the economy because of the lack of water in the Mississippi and the, and the difficulty of moving it. Three months later, we we're in another uh, flood situation. So this is a reality throughout the United States. Um, and the issues of governance and the scale with which we're dealing with this are 
a large part of what I have to deal with uh, as a lawyer and as a policy person. But the question is, what does the design community have to do with that? And how can the design community interact with policy uh, professionals in order to create a way forward? Um, the, uh, uh, Isla's introduction was talking about the massive scale of the Great Lakes. It is a huge issue in getting people's minds around how we move forward, what the problem is to perceive real issues. Um, I've been asked to talk about homing this into a particular part of the Great Lakes, which is um, where the city of Chicago meets the, um, meets the Great Lakes. Uh, it is, let's see, I th do I push this thing? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, not technically, um, I think that it's a bit bourgeois. So anyway, uh, here is where Chicago meets, meets the Great Lakes. This is um, a, 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 a watershed that is 20% uh, of, uh, essentially 20% of the water of, of the globe in terms of available water, about 90% in the United States. Um, we also are directly connected with the, um, through the Chicago River with uh, the Mississippi. Um, here is our office, which is on the edge of uh, the, the, the Chicago River, um, and it is the Chicago Opera House. I'm, I'm, I'm identifying it because uh, part of what has been discussed previously in, this, in the, these series of seminars is energy, land, and water. I believe part of what we need to do to move forward and what the design community needs to be involved with is how we look at these things as not fragmented, but actually united together. And we looked at, at, at Jim's uh, slides at the beginning talking about the significant impact on, uh, on the globe with regard to climate change from the built environment. We're going to have to talk about the built environment, its impact on energy, the release of carbon uh, and other pollutants, and what that means to the watershed and to our management of water. Um, this is a picture of our nice interior office, which we redesigned. Um, and it is, it's a lead platinum site, it's a part of the living building challenge. It is significantly within this 1929 building, reduced the demand within our office space dramatically below what happens with other parts of, of, of the building which have not been so retrofitted. It is part of the solution and it ties into the future of how we manage water. Uh, because of the reduction of energy demand, it has a reduction on the sources of climate change. Um, I've got uh, Sam Minsel in here, who I think has been deeply uh, underestimated in terms of a great visionary. He was the, ar uh, the person who came with the idea of building the building we're in. He also was the architect of the uh, integrated uh, utility, electric utility. Uh, it is his great work um, that actually has helped propel us dramatically into a climate change world. Uh, here's a site, here's a facility in the middle of Chicago, which he bought in 1907 from Thomas Edison, which is in the middle of, of uh, a community right on the, on the river's edge. And it was a ma it's a major source of uh, carbon, carbon pollution within the urban core. Uh, it is also a major source of pollution into the Chicago River. Uh, and it has to do with safe and sufficient water in the micro level at the, in, within the city of Chicago and its impact globally. Um, after a number of years of litigation, we were successful in getting that closed. It had been a cutting-edge facility in 1907, uh, and uh, it was a source of massive pollution by the time we were able to get it closed. Um, going to the built environment, here is a, uh, uh, the building where the Burnham Plan was actually um, uh, created. Behind those round, uh, round windows was where the Burnham Plan uh, was, 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 was drafted. This building, which is also the uh, headquarters of SOM, has gone into a uh, building retrofit program in the city of Chicago, where uh, along with uh, the auditorium building, which is a little down the street, uh, are uh, 19th and early 20th century buildings, which have done massive retrofit to reduce energy demand. It is part of the solution set which has to tie into distributed implementation of uh, solutions that the design community is part of in order to reduce the drivers that are making uh, us have a climate problem and the associated water program uh, problems. Um, I mentioned 
the city of Chicago and, and the Great Lakes and the Mississippi. This is the um, place where the Mississippi and the Great Lakes meet. It is the uh, uh, opening of the river of the city of Chicago. Um, it is uh, in, in uh, over 100 years ago, Chicago reversed the river to take water from the Great Lakes in order to take our sewage and send it to Peoria, St. Louis, uh, Memphis, New Orleans, and it now is the largest contributor of uh, uh, nutrient pollution to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So it is a, a large, large reach of dealing with how we systemically can make interventions in the built environment with global impacts. Um, uh, the previous panel was talking about how events can actually bring this to the public mind. Um, this, was, this is a picture taken um, in April of 2013. We had an amazing inundation of rain, so much so that it filled the river with so much untreated sewage that it, uh, on its own, reversed itself. And you can see the dark movement of water through the river out into the lake into where we get our fresh water. Um, if this is not something that should be folks in the imagination, I'm not sure what is. But it's very much, you know, I, I really think the fact that the Chicago River in many parts is 70% untreated sewage every day is kind of an issue. Uh, the fact, <laughs> and you know, I like, I, I use the word poo a lot when I talk to, to the public, because uh, I think it's easy to understand. Um, but, but it is something about how we start rethinking what our resources are, what our assets are, and what we need to do to fix it. Um, um, this is a, a, a drawing from um, uh, 1673, a hand uh, drawing by Louis Joliet about his trip through the Great Lakes down the Mississippi, and identifies right where Chicago is that there's a portage here that if we did a, a canal, we'd be able to connect uh, New France to New Spain and create all this opportunity for, for uh, trade. Uh, what happened was it eventually occurred. Now every day, uh, every second, massive amounts of water taken out of the fresh water seas, the Great Lakes, to mix with sewage to send it down to the Great Lakes, uh, out of the Great Lakes into the Mississippi. Uh, it's the kind of thing that is a set expectation, is accepted because it's background noise. People have a hard time believing that it's a reality, but it is globally affecting watersheds of incredible value in a, in a, in a freshwater constrained world. I'm going to go over this. That's Juliet. Now, this was uh, initially on the up, upper side is how the Chicago River used to meet Lake Michigan. It was a small sort of tired little stream. Um, and the Des Plaines River was the point where there was a portage. And these were connected. So our, our sewage is now going down the river, as I said, into these other communities after a result of building these, these canals. Um, and now we have, going into the city of Chicago, you meet, you meet the Mississippi on the other side of that barrier. Um, there are unanticipated issues around that. Um, we continue to pollute the, the, the Great Lakes. We continue to uh, live with a sewer system that doesn't quite work. We don't treat the, the water as the value it's supposed to have. We've done a great deal of advocacy around this. Um, where I think is interesting for the design community is uh, the fact that there's a need to make it visible make it understood, make it understand what the alternatives can be. Uh, we collaborated with uh, an architect who has uh, addressed this group before, uh, Jeannie Gang, who uh, is a big supporter of ours, on how to look at the future of the river and bring a design sense to fixing it. And we published a, a book called Reverse Effect about how we could reverse the reversal of the Chicago River uh, in order to meet a number of problems, among them being the immediate problem of uh, invasive species going up and down the river, uh, undercutting the ecology and health of the, of the, of, of, of the uh, fresh water itself, uh, and how we could actually fix that problem and generate significant value 
for uh, the city itself. We homed in a on a particular part of, of, of that system, uh, did a comparison about what presently a series of abandoned, abandoned areas that continue to uh, leak pollutants into the river system. And if you redid it, what it would mean in terms of enhanced ecological integrity and to create a vision where people could actually arrange themselves around it and get their heads around it. Uh, fortunately, our mayor got very interested in this and, and actually hired Jeannie to put together a series of boat houses to bring people down to the river. Um, I pointed out that you'll be um, rowing on 70% untreated sewage, uh, but, but that might be an advocacy point, you know, like a public hanging. It could focus the imagination admirably that we need to fix this up and change our infrastructure so that it actually performs well. Um, Floating and recreating on essentially a public toilet is not a great thing, but that also adds to the pollution of the Great Lakes. This is a picture from this summer of Lake Erie. Uh, this is a gigantic plume of toxic algae. It is toxic algae that comes from two sources, one from climate change and one from runoff going into the Great Lakes is the kind of runoff that we're sending to the Mississippi uh, and what happens as a result of that is for many days, people dependent upon public water sources on the, eastern, on the western side of Lake Erie were not able to drink water because it could kill them. Um, the deep, icky sludge is uh, aesthetically disgusting, but it's also fatal. Uh, these are things that are being driven by climate change, being driven by invasive species, and being driven by runoff that we are, are, are not properly managing. We have clear problems. We have clear solutions to these problems of dealing with, uh, with runoff, of dealing with uh, mitigating climate change, but we don't have the systems to deliver it. We have need, solutions, and the, the great area of, of where the shadow falls is not having the political will to actually change business as usual. Um, in our cities like in Chicago, we have these combined sewer systems that are built for an entirely different weather regime. You get one and a half inches of rain in the city of Chicago and it overcomes the sewage system and it pours into the river. Um, it blows the tops off of, uh, of, of, of manhole covers. Um, and uh, here's a, from the Washington Post. Um, it's a, a family on the south side of Chicago who's lived in the same house for three generations. In the last five years, their basement has been inundated repeatedly by backup from the sewage system, uh, creating a, a public health issue downgrading the property value and uh, uh, helping drive uh, movement from parts of the city that used to be uh, solid, solidly uh, occupied. Uh, these climate change issues, overcoming our institutional, uh, our infrastructure, with our institutions not being able to respond to them effectively, um, creates a whole range of, uh, of issues and, and uh, issues that we need to, need to address. Uh, one more point is tied to the entire uh, fossil fuel uh, initiative um, that we are living with. Um, this is a pile of petroleum coke in the midst of a working class community. Um, it's along uh, the Calumet River in the south side of Chicago. It is abandoned, was at one time abandoned property. Um, the uh, affiliate of the Koch brothers, which deals in petroleum coke, takes the residue from a tar sand refinery uh, just across the state border, stockpiles it in the middle of this community, and ships it to, um, uh, to China. Uh, it is literally across the street from uh, a residential community. There are people who say, we actually live here, we are invested in this community, we've been here for generations, and we'll be driven out uh, if this is not dealt with. The solution set around rethinking what our river edges should be, how they interact with the community, how they interact with the, the broader water resources that we're poised on the edge of, are all tied to getting a sense of how water, community, people, and our energy economy are deeply integrated. 
Um, we have before us a range of decisions we have to make on the national level and the state level about these infrastructure decisions. And putting a price on carbon, putting a price on fossil fuels, putting a, a, a thing that nudges us forward into thinking about these things in a much more integrated way is where we need to be. So I'll finish up with what I think ought to be the image of a built environment living in an appropriate balance with uh, very, very rich water resources uh, that we need to develop the, the systems, the governance systems, in order to actually make this a possibility, which today it is not. So um, with that, thank you. Did you hear me if I spoke uh, without the microphone? Yeah. In the back, raise your hand. We're good. So I'm going to present uh, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin. And this highlighted area here is the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin combined in this orange, OK? The St. Lawrence River is what drains the Great Lakes out into the Atlantic Ocean. And what I want to do is just walk through as quickly as I can for a Midwestern guy in New York, uh, some of the importance of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes host some of our nation's best cities, Chicago. It's where we recreate. And it's also host to a lot of our very endemic and unique habitats, habitats that are really unique to the world. And SOM uh, embarked on this notion of creating a Great Lakes century. Why? Because what I want to tell you about is that Great Lakes are vast and yet they're vulnerable and they're really in need of a vision. A vision that sort of, that, that embraces a lot of the things that previous speakers have raised. And so every day we would challenge ourselves, how big can you think? And you have to be able to think big because the Great Lakes themselves are very big. They're a big chunk of our continent. And in fact, they're big enough to create their own weather system. And the Great Lakes Basin contains roughly 20% of the Earth's fresh water, roughly 85% of North America's water, almost 10% of the U.S. population, et cetera. You can read these stats. And if you unravel the coastline of the Great Lakes, and we all were sort of taking bets about this, how much would it be? If you unravel that into a string, you could actually go from Chicago to Perth. Right? That's an incredible and vast asset that the Great Lakes Basiners have. Simple scale comparison over Europe, this is just the lakes and the river, not the watershed itself, just the water bodies. And so what constitutes that area? It's roughly half four, well, 40% four, so you can see the number. But what's remarkable to me is all the, herb, all the degradation we talk about, we associate with the urban environment, which is only 4%. How can that be? Well, really, what we have to do as designers is make sure we consider agriculture is really part of the urban environment. You can't have a city without the urban. Don't think of ag and rural as somewhere else in somebody else's design problem. It's integral to the architect and design community. And conserving our ecology as well is necessary to support these cities. So today we have about 470 million people in North America, roughly, and we're expecting about 650 million people in North America. And the question is, where do we want these people to live? In Phoenix, sorry, southern LA, where there isn't water, or perhaps in the Great Lakes, where we have resources. And we could actually double the density of, for example, Chicago. We could add 3 million people in Chicago without building a single new road. Essentially, no new urban infrastructure and have that be a density lower than Paris. And Paris is a pretty livable city. So despite this vastness, the region is vulnerable. Okay, we're vulnerable to the uncertainty of climate change. We've talked about fragmentation. Well, the Great Lakes is two nations, uh, many reservations, states, provinces. By the way, New York State is a Great Lakes state. It is one of the eight. Uh, and roughly 15,000 cities and communities. So in terms of managing and, and envisioning something and getting everybody behind it, there are a lot of people, a lot of organizations that have to come together around a singular vision. 
We are, of course, also vulnerable to the uh, energy sources that we've been talking about, agricultural runoff, Henry mentioned, sprawling development. Um, we already have zoned over 10,000 square miles of urban sprawl. It's already planned. Urban runoff, environmentally degraded areas, invasive species, by the way, very important to know, invasive species are the, is a two-way channel. And by the way, it connects the two largest freshwater basins in North America, the Great Lakes Basin and the Mississippi Basin. Now have access for invasive species, they can share them. Okay, so we need a vision for this. There needs to be some kind of vision, and the, what we present is not the vision, it is a vision, right? And what we need to do is get all the voices together and figure out what should be the vision and work towards a common goal. Uh, our Great Lakes vision uh, is sort of, is based on this idea of one thinking big, acting together uh, with a shared common vision. And that if we rally around these vulnerable, these vast but vulnerable watersheds, we can actually achieve something. Uh, so a 100-year vision includes things, I'm going to be very high level here, uh, things like restoring our native, and la la native, uh, native landscapes and habitats, farming more responsibly, uh, greening our cities, really simple ideas, clean our air, protecting the Great Basin to achieve some form of integrity, some form of ecological integrity. That means designing holistically, thinking about the basin as a place. How do we as designers, engineers, planners, do it at a scale that's far beyond the typical boundaries? How do we do that to achieve some <coughs> form of holistic integrity? Uh, and I think it's really critical because this water really is our future, not just for Great Lakes Basiners, but for the way we live in North America. It's a way to set some leadership for watersheds around the world, which are really struggling with these very same types of issues. We put together an exhibit uh, about these ideas that were hosted in the lobby of our office, uh, of our office building that uh, Henry showed a picture of. And we heard some things that you know, somewhat surprised us and a little bit different than the way we were thinking. But what we did is we created this exhibit and we had a little place that we called the Basiner's Corner, a Great Lakes Basiner's Corner. And there were three things that we heard, <coughs> generally. One was about optimism. And this was really important because typically we think of ourselves as being part of the Rust Belt, a dying region of the nation. But having this common vision, these nice simple ideas that we have, that we put forth, started to get people optimistic about the area, about remediation. There's lots of good examples of remediation going on, restoration and revitalizing economies based on this access to water. It was a very positive change in, in language. And the notion, this optimistic notion that yes, we can do this, we can help design this potential future. There was also discussion about growth population growth, whereas normally we think about Flint, Michigan, we think about Detroit, all this vacant land in Chicago. But here's a notion of growth. Here's a notion of population growing. How are we going to afford these things? Well, we'll have more people. We have to find out how we're going to put them to work and generate economies that leverage our great assets of coastlines and water, transit, etc. We also found, uh, just a little factoid from the Brookings Institute, that this makes a lot of economic sense. Investing in ecology of your place gives a very strong return. There's more and more research indicating that investing in your ecology is a foundation for a strong economy. They should not be thought of as separate things, just like water, land, air should not be independently designed. We need to design our ecology uh, and our economy in a similar fashion. <coughs> and also connectivity, which is really my, my favorite sort of lesson from this exercise was connectivity. And there's really three types of connectivity that came across. One, physical. We want to make physical connections between the different places of the Great Lakes. High-speed rail between Milwaukee, Chicago, to Toronto. We need to connect our people physically. We connect the basin physically. We want to connect uh, emotionally. We want to have a place. If we don't design a place and live in a place that we love, we are not going to protect have to have an emotional connection. 
in order to protect it. We have to design a beautiful place, a great place to live. And we have to connect intellectually. We have to understand what it means to live in the basin. Whatever basin you're in, by the way, we're all in a basin. What does it mean to live there in that particular place? Right? These dialogues were happening as a result of the sort of putting forth a vision for the Great Lakes region. <clears throat> now I want to shift gears, if I can, to talk a little bit more about Chicago, uh, to put some sort of context into what Chicago, the city of Chicago is doing to help protect uh, our water resources, in particular uh, what the water utility has been doing. This, by the way, is a picture of our great river. This is the, the Chicago River, which is under a lot of scrutiny these days. There's the North Branch that heads out to the main stem, and the South Branch is coming up through here. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful and a wonderful asset for Chicago. And this here graphic is, is representing the total pumpage of the City of Chicago's Department of Water Management, which serves all of Chicago, plus some uh, communities outside of Chicago. And you'll see, it may be hard to read in the back, this is 1990 to 2014. The, the, the millions of gallons pumped out of our plant, which is pumping from the Great Lakes. All of our water comes from the Great Lakes, all of our municipal water. We don't have any groundwater resources. And you can see the trend, which results in 320 million gallons saved every day as a result of a number of actions. You can see listed there, I just have time to introduce a few of them. Uh, the key, some of the key initiatives, investments, capital investments by the Department of Water Management are things like fixing water mains. Okay, our water mains are very old. Uh, historically, we have not had to fuss too much about a scarcity of water. There's this notion that we got plenty of it. Not really true, and it's not okay even if it is true. Right? We should not be leaking our water uh, and putting in all the energy that's associated with treatment <coughs> and then letting that uh, go into the ground. We also have uh, something called uh, hydrant custodians. It's really a fun little topic we can get into someday. Uh, this kid here is obviously playing with a fire hydrant. Uh, we see that as stealing our water uh, because hydrants are not metered. It's an unaccounted for flow. It lowers the pressure in our system greatly, which, we do, which increases a fire safety risk. And of course, unfortunately, very sadly, Every single year, kids are killed in the street for playing, playing in water with uh, hydrant water. It is a real problem, and we have a, a, what we call a little arms race to try and design ways to make hydrants unaccessible uh, to residents, but accessible to the firemen. Uh, so there's a significant loss of water. The majority of our unaccounted for flows, in utility speak, is through hydrants. And metering. It's a major deal uh, for the city of Chicago. Very sadly, we have poor history in metering our accounts. The vast majority of our residents don't have metered water. Right? So they don't have a sense of how much they're using. They're not paying for how much they use. They're paying on some sort of flat rate system. And it's a real issue. And it relates to some of these policy issues that came up earlier. We have regulations that prohibit the city of Chicago to charge city residents uh, more or uh, less than what we charge a suburban customer. And so as a result, we have some perverse ways of, of financing our infrastructure. Um, so I also want to point out a few other issues, uh, a few other uh, initiatives of the city of Chicago that make a great deal of splash in the paper. That's about their buildings. Uh, we've had several ordinances passed where the design of our buildings, uh, both public and private uh, buildings, is really changing. The face of our public buildings in particular is changing. I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, and so, for example, this is now a typical design of a firehouse. Thank you. Uh, where we have green roofs standard, open space standard, solar panels you can't see, porous pavement over here you probably can't really tell. But those are now all standard practice to help manage our stormwater resources a little differently. We have more uh, green roof in the city of Chicago than any other uh, city in North America. Uh, we've converted a lot of our impervious areas into porous areas, which allow some of this infiltration to occur. Now, we don't, we don't use that infiltrated water as a potential water source. We don't have that need. 
but we do want to restore our groundwater resources and take the strain off of the sewer systems so that we don't have as many overflows that Henry uh, was talking about. We've also designed, now this is somewhat tangential, but I, I do like to point out that we can design as urban planners, we can turn our cities into energy producers. This is a brownfield turned uh, energy production, low carbon solar energy production, largest urban uh, solar field in the US. Uh, obviously relates to our energy consumption climate change. And what I want to leave you with is this image. This image uh, represents the globe, of course. You can see it's dry. All the water on the globe is now represented in this large circle, including the oceans, including the atmospheric water. Okay? This is what it would look like if you made a big raindrop. The medium-sized ball there is the volume of water of fresh water. That's all the fresh water on the planet. Roughly 1%, sort of depends how you count. And this tiny little ball over Atlanta is actually the amount of fresh water that's available to us as humans. That's what we have to work with. It is imperative that we design our systems to manage this very scarce resource. We need to figure out how we do this um, what the term? holistic design uh, to, takes into account our policies, our physical, our ecological systems. Right? That's, I think, our challenge of this century for the architects, urban planners, and the room. And I think with that, I'll leave it. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. We're really excited about um, being participants in this discussion. Um, some of what, whoops, some of what we'll have to share with you today will be um, um, perhaps a bit familiar, but maybe um, t through a different lens. Um, as was discussed, Marie and I are designers. We practice together as Maid Studio, um, and we're really um, interested in the discussions about bringing expertise from lots of different places towards this common goal about um, water, uh, which we're thinking of in terms of water civitas. So today we're going to share our thoughts on the potential for design and research to intermingle and help move attitudes shaping water infrastructure um, throughout the Great Lakes specifically, from its legacy of industrialized expediency to one of water civitas. And by coupling concepts of civitas with water, we can approach the design of water systems with a sense of shared responsibility and common purpose. And this in turn can produce a sense of community that emerges from a set of rights and responsibilities that are collectively held. On December 7th, 1972, the first photograph taken of a fully illuminated whole earth, and still the only one ever taken by a human, was snapped. Its authorship is still contested, but the three-man the three -man crew on the Apollo 17 were all in agreement that seeing the earth out of the window left them with a profound sense of leaving. So much so that one or possibly all of them abandoned their critical tasks for just long enough to visually record the moment. Since then, the blue marble has become the most reproduced photograph in history and has played a role in shaping our collective imagination of the fragility of the balance of Earth's natural resources, as was pointed out in the last image of how small um, the water drop is. The two images you see here are the version, a contemporary version of the blue marble, which are stitched together from images collected by NASA's remote sensing device, MODIS, a visualization technique that allows for compensation for when clouds get in the way, or also provides a kind of complete view um, within which we can identify and locate ourselves. And possibly be reminded of just how small even the most freshwater abundant region of, in the world is. So you're now looking at the, the watersheds that Maria and I are visiting you all from, um, the Great Lakes Basin. <coughs> the basin constitutes a mere 0.15% of the Earth's surface, yet it holds roughly 20% of the available total fresh water. So it is an issue of abundance, and as we saw before, we, we do um, um, influence weather in terms of, of, of thunderstorms and snow. Um, but we also have some really distinct differences that emerge throughout the Great Lakes region. When you look a little closer, it's a bit washed out. Um, but what's important is a sense of time. Um, the, the difference 
in terms of cycle inflow varies from 191 years of turnover rate in Lake Superior um, to a mere three years in Lake Erie, which has significant influence in terms of how we think about um, what goes in and how long it stays in the system. When it's visualized just through drawing surface water, as is seen here, it looks like an incredibly um, interconnected system, which is partly true. Uh, but when we overlay the urban systems and the terrestrial way that we've organized infrastructure, you start to understand the system um, as a much more fragmented um, community. Um, and this is what the, the drawing that you see here was um, trying to uh, address. All of the gray hatch are areas of mismatch between how political jurisdictions are laid out throughout the territory and the way that the, water the watersheds or the flow on the surface are organized. And so these are contested areas that are of multiple ownership and often um, sort of left out of specific visions. We can also look at the region in terms of um, the legacy of the pressure of urbanization, most of which was um, put into place by um, the connection of the waterways and the way that um, flows of, of goods and commerce were, were working in the area. Um, which really did force a certain expediency in terms of how the infrastructure was constructed. Um, the cities were already growing rapidly to support factories and all sorts of um, industrial activity, which meant that the infrastructure was built very quickly, um, almost a shovel-ready project, as you'll see in the case of Detroit. Um, but it's left us with a really strong legacy, which you've already heard about, of the combined sewers and all the failures. Um, so what you're seeing here is just one snapshot of one event, all the green or all the outfall events happening in the region, all of that sewage working its way into the water, um, which we know is also a huge energy problem because it's all the more water to clean, which necessarily shouldn't have to be thought of that way. And so our work really started by um, looking at this larger system unfolding um, that shoreline that we also saw makes its way to Perth, um, and really trying to make links between the decisions that we're making landward uh, with the out outcomes in terms of the water. Um, and the work that I've shared so far has been um, made possible through a Taubman College Research Through Making grant. Um, Maria is going to take you um, into the Lake Erie watershed more specifically and take a look at Detroit. Hey, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we have been doing in, in Detroit. And this is uh, growing from this initial set of research and bringing together work that we have done in collaboration with uh, an institute in our university, the Graham Institute for Sustainability, and working with a local nonprofit called Data Driven Detroit that is interested exactly in that, in making data available for all kinds of stakeholders interested in participating in, in the city. So what you think here is a little bit a way of summarizing what are some of the dynamics that um, we can see in the Great Lakes area. And there are dynamics of people leaving the cities but still staying in the regions around. That means uh, that if you follow in between the 50s and 2010, what you see is not that there are <coughs> less dots in those diagrams. The number of population remains more or less stable, but most of those po points have abandoned the city. So what that is um, imposing on the infrastructure is a little bit of what you can see down. These are um, two comparisons in between the wastewater system and the water system in Detroit. So what you see is that the systems are massive. In the case of waste, it's six times larger than the city of Detroit itself. That is the little red boundary that you see, and you won't see uh, that repeated in the presentation. And in the case of the water supply, what you see is a system that is eight times larger than the city itself. But uh, still, they're heavily centralized. In both cases, you see that the wastewater treatment plant is very much in the boundaries of the city, and most of the water treatment plants are also really inside or very close to those uh, boundaries. So this is important because when we are discussing issues of uh, climate change, we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but what we know is that precipitation is going to be more intense. And that is exactly the best way of challenging the current infrastructure that we have in place. That would, as we have seen before, it's a combined system, meaning that all the water is coming together and challenging tremendously the way in which the wastewater treatment plant can actually not, not handle all that. So these are some images of the current situation. We have an abundance of water, theoretically, but what we see in here are people protesting because they are actually going through household shutoffs. They are not 
having access to water. And this is Detroit in October 2014. And at the same time, we don't need a major storm event to see flooding occurring in our streets, which means that there is a real uh, detachment in between how we are handling water with the infrastructure that we have right now in place. And there is a long legacy. Uh, what we think here is the Detroit River and the long standing legacy of industrial sites populating the very waterfront. Why? Because the rivers were understood as part of that larger infrastructure system that was enabling industries to use water, but also transportation to happen pretty expediently. And what you see, a little bit smaller, a little bit washed out, is also that it's at the very moment where the failure of the system is also built. All the outfalls that are ensuring that the wastewater treatment plant is not overwhelmed, those are little holes in the pipes that allow water to be released into the Detroit River before, and the Rouge River before being treated in the wastewater treatment plant. And yes, we know that the systems were designed as such. These are images that bring us to 1920s when the infrastructure was, was first laid out in the city of Detroit. And what you see here is that there was no mediation in between the pipes and the river. Water was directly disposed in the river. It was understood that dilution was the solution and that was enough. But what you see down is also a long imaginary very much embedded in the city of Detroit of people trying to engage physically, experientially with that water and that water being always in a trouble situation, close to a pipe in the river or under once again major flooding events. And this is a situation that has been carried through the entire 20th century. Here we are looking at 1990s and what you see is that it's still the city is dealing with massive, massive failure. A lot of, uh, many, many billions of uh, water being uh, disposed into the river before being treated. And here you see technological determinism, thinking that we can resolve all these issues by putting many different uh, infrastructure systems completely detached from any kind of human experience. We cannot see them. Down they are operating for us. And culminating with a project that was supposed to be started in 2008, exactly the same year in which a huge economic crisis hit Detroit as many other cities. And that project that was almost gonna reach a one billion budget um, was canceled. And from there, here we are in a time in which all kind of colors assigned to infrastructure are starting to emerge as a solution. Now we are starting to talk about gray infrastructure being right-sized. In lieu of that, we are starting to use green and blue infrastructure as solutions. But just look at the comparison in between the ranges of water that the gray infrastructure system was supposed to handle versus what it is that we are asking to the green infrastructure system to perform. This is looking at one of the two rivers that are bounding the city of Detroit. In this case, we are looking at the Rouge River. And of course, this is presenting two main issues for us. On one side, new opportunities that are emerging in the city that had to do with new governance. There are many, many different groups that are starting to participate at very different scales operating to make some of these projects possible. We are talking about philanthropies. We are talking about nonprofits that are working at the local level. We are talking about a lot of citizens. And we are talking about all these entities coming together and matching funds that have traditionally come from federal and municipal sources that are right now much smaller. And that's why all these groups are coming together to facilitate uh, some of these projects. But at the same time, I want to ask you, what do you see in here? It is literally an intervention that is bringing a mix of grasses that are performing to hold stormwater in a vacant residential lot. And if it's not because of that little sign in there, there is no way in which residents can understand what are the potentials of, of these new landscapes that we are starting to discuss as possible solutions. It's an issue of legibility, and that's exactly what the design disciplines can and should be contributing as part of those larger groups of people that are starting to engage some of these discussions. So looking again at the city, this is a simplification of the really, really complicated system that is at play. 
and I'm gonna go relatively quickly, but for you to see that the system continues to fail, continues to fail a lot, and the fact that we have new infrastructure, green infrastructure uh, being presented as a way of engaging the residents, the wastewater treatment plant is undergoing major investment and increasing the capacity that that wastewater treatment plant needs to have to resolve some of the existing issues. And what we are exploring in here are new ways of drawing that same geography. And what we are doing in here is using GIS to redraw the city following different conventions. Here you see flow accumulation, and what this is telling us is where water, and water tends to accumulate in the city right now. And you see two areas selected that uh, we are gonna share with you a little bit more in detail. Here we are trying to match opportunities, uh, looking at vacant parcels and some of um, those existing areas that are operating in these two situations. On one side, understanding how sewer sheds and water sheds are not working together in the city and there are some opportunities to make some of those overlaps visible. And in the other, um, looking at how two very different conditions, one of an infrastructural system, we are talking about a greenway in the city, and the other about a patch condition, residential area. And this is just very quickly to give you a sense of how different is the reality in Detroit, just uh, as a way of comparing Detroit to um, a city like Chicago. Not that we are not optimistic, but we have a different reality that we need to work with. This is uh, one of these neighborhoods. Um, we are looking at Brightmore, and what you see here is what it is that you experience, and down there some of the analysis that we have been doing. And what is really, really important for us here is to understand that even if there is an overabundance of vacancy, that doesn't mean that the land is in public ownership. And that is putting a lot of challenges in any possibility to implement larger green and blue infrastructural systems. The fragmentation of the ownership in the vacant land is in some areas of the city pretty striking. So there are many, many initiatives that are in place in the last uh, couple of years that are trying to um, facilitate this situation, but it's still a larger issue. More examples of what are some of those small, really, really small green infrastructure projects that are starting to activate uh, former residential uses that are now vacant. And in the case of the De Quinder Cut, here we are engaging a very, very important civic project that the city has been uh, investing on. We are talking about a former rail line, one of those that is being transformed in a greenway. And this is a movement that is slowly taking shape in the city and is starting to operate at a regional level. So some of the things that we have been looking in here is how we can provide alternative imaginaries of how this project could little by little take shape. Because we are of course very critical in the way in which the project has been shaped in some of the initial phases. And in the way in which we are trying to open up that conversation is using some of the existing civic infrastructures along the Greenway to use them as opportunities to literally speculate on design opportunities that reveal water and make that water performance, dealing with the storm water, uh, visible to all the residents. So in a way, um, what we see, and we are really, really optimistic about this, is that design could be presented as a platform to give shape to the new imaginaries of a water civitas that is supposed to transform current urban responses to climate change by negotiating civic agendas in a new generation of water infrastructures. Uh, obviously, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about how we use the logics of nature as a way of rethinking and retooling our urban environment. We talk about it, you know, in terms of the urban biosphere uh, or sort of uh, ecologics that now get applied to urban systems. And, um, and I think there are two sort of examples that have come out or two issues in relation to um, the presentations. One around this notion of green infrastructure. And green infrastructure, I think it's been sort of foregrounded, I don't want to say as uh, low-hanging fruit in a way, but uh, has been foregrounded as a critical strategy to infiltrate, to store, uh, treat storm and wastewater, uh, deal with uh, conditions of flooding, et cetera, because environmental pollutants have become you know, one of the larger issues um, in relation to the Great Lakes area. And so, and at the same time, it's linked to public infrastructure, public space, quality of life, uh, et cetera. A and it would seem to be something that could be readily implemented and also taken on by, uh, by the design community. I mean, 
you know, when we talk about sort of a larger, a larger economy. So the, the question is, you know, what are the potential catalysts that will move this forward? Because there's a big difference between uh, photoshopping green, uh, and we've seen this sort of in multiple projects, right? The photoshopping of green onto every urban street and the actual implementation of that. What are the impediments uh, and what are the kinds of catalysts that could uh, move that forward, not just into new projects, but to take on uh, take on cities, whether it's you know Chicago, Toronto, uh, or Detroit. Uh, I think there are a couple of things. Um, I think there there is a lot of uh, public skepticism about it. I think there is also um, uh, bureaucratic skepticism uh, on taking on uh, absolutely untested or un, 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 un trusted methodologies where people are responsible for delivering a particular result and uh, if they do something that is not exactly reflected in the standard uh, process of their profession, uh, they're, they're legally liable. They're personally uh, exposed and um, accordingly we need to make more mature the practice and for uh, people to, to evolve the methodologies and metrics to make it something that can be relied upon. I also think it goes back to something the previous panel was talking about with regard to uh, central governance or dispersed governance. Uh, the idea of doing green infrastructure as a major way of affecting the watershed means that you have to have in your plan a lot of things that are not bureaucratically uh, managed at the center. And there has to be a great deal of evolved practice uh, throughout the watershed to know that this actually is going to perform because other people are going to be responsible for performing, implementing, and taking long-term responsibility for it. That is a habit and a structural uh, need that, uh, that has not matured yet. Yeah, I would say probably the um the single most important issue that is delaying some of these projects is that most of these projects are actually being used to test the capacity of some of these systems. So pretty much calculating how much of one specific species of tree or one specific combination of grasses can actually do in terms of holding that water. And also knowing that there needs to be done a lot of research only trying to understand um, how we work with urban soils that have been deeply disturbed and compacted. Mm -hmm. So all these little projects that are not very visible are, are, are right now um, driving a lot of data that is going to be used as best management practices. And it's happening at this scale, but Detroit is starting to move forward to larger scales in a different location of the city, in which uh, some of our colleagues in the School of Natural Resources, and Josh is doing tremendous work on this too, also in the city of Detroit, are starting to um, work uh, on larger areas uh, with many other colleagues that range from people in engineering but also in public health and trying to figure out how some of these projects could be quantified and offered as, um, as tools for new projects to emerge. What we see in most of these projects is the total lack of designers and we are talking about the city of Detroit. There is very little design intelligence, there is very little design contribution in, in many of these projects right now and that's where we see a tremendous opportunity too. But yeah, it's... Uh, Pete, do you, uh, because you've been, you were talking about it in relation to the projects with SOM, that you know it was becoming part of standard practice. So, uh, do you want to talk about that, maybe in terms of uh, how you could see it also being used as a retrofit strategy from those things that have been learned within the projects that you're dealing with? Uh, sure, but yeah, I, first I'll say I agree with the other speakers in terms of impediments. Uh, we really do need to change the perception and the regulatory framework that goes along with that that allows uh, these types of things to be implemented, the green infrastructure solutions. The other thing I wanted to add to that conversation, though, um, is the uh, need to get the private sector involved. So many times when we talk about green infrastructure, people go straight to the right-of-way, and they want to squeeze all the green infrastructure into the right-of-way. Well, the rooftops and the buildings and everything else also need to have these same principles, and I think that's where uh, another place the de design community can contribute. And that's a policy change. And in Chicago, uh, we were able to 
changed the policies and the way our buildings were built. Uh, we, and we started with public buildings, the, the buildings that the city of Chicago designs and builds. We started doing that differently first and implementing these strategies uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter changed and started to ratchet up those same requirements for developers. Uh, so that was a strategy we took, we, you know, so, so to speak, um, um, by, by leadership, designed by leadership. And that's, so, so that, that has been effective. And now green, and green roofs, when they started, I can tell you, boy, there was a lot of resistance and skeptical people. Or another even easier example is white roofs, the changing of the roof codes to be white to address urban heat island, you would have thought this was going to, you know, the world was going to crash. But now if you go on Google Earth and just do a quick time tool on the Google over Chicago, and you will see a dramatic change in the color of the city. Our rooftops are not black. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. That happened, really, that change happened in, in a matter of a decade or so. Uh, because rooftops, of course, change more rapidly than the building stock itself. Uh, so you can see that kind of change. And what, what, were, what were the catalysts for that? I mean, are, is it coming from policy, uh, regulation? Is it coming from uh, design? Is it coming from education in relation to the community? Yeah, I have to say, it's, it's everything, of course. In Chicago's example, we had some serious leadership uh, that maybe didn't understand the depth. Sorry to say it, Mayor Day. He may not have understood all the technical issues, but he understood the importance of addressing this. He didn't necessarily know how, nor did anybody else, but some in some corners we were willing to take some risks and, uh, and start to implement things. You were going to add to that? Well, I, I remember uh, I was actually, I was Commissioner of Environment for the city and I was on a trip with Mayor Daley and he was really bored and looked out the window and saw a green roof and said, what is that? And they explained it to him. He said, I want one of those. And we got back home. He said, get me one of them. And, um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I came up with a, a price for City Hall for, I think it was $650,000 to do a really simple thing. He said, I'm not going to tell the taxpayer we're paying $650 to put grass on my roof. And, um, uh, and he ended up, uh, actually, it was like north of $6 million or something. Because uh, it was like, we want to make this a vision for the future and things added on to it and it became then something that we got performance metrics on in terms of what it did in terms of reducing costs of operating the building, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the kind of thing of implementation with the desire to learn and gather the metrics and then turn it into a regulatory product because that's what happened. It became a regulatory product about how to get approval to build et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just doing, it's translating it into law that's necessary. And what's, what, from your perspective, is the role of design? And I'll come back to the designers within this process, because it seems like uh, the political regulation uh, and political jurisdiction somehow uh, are the thing that becomes, the things that become the greatest drivers um, rather than design, and design becomes reactive. Uh, rather than proactive in that process? Uh, I, I think that there are a range of innovative designers that can actually take the opportunity and make it a reality that performs. Uh, the, we've been really lucky working with some really first-rate uh, architects, designers, and engineers on how you do something that actually performs and with a desire to make it work as opposed to uh, arbitrary aesthetic preferences that don't endure. How did, how, did those, how did those collaborations happen? I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm asking this because I think this is always the question that comes from the design community. Was it architects that were coming to you, and I'm asking you because of your role, your political role within this, uh, is it designers, architects, landscape architects, planners coming to you with propositions, or is it operating the other way around? How are the collaborations uh, how do they start up? Uh, I, I think it's both and, and I, I think par partially you have to have an, uh, the, the, the design community has a real interest, but there is a demand, may, we want this to happen. I mean, the thing we've done with, uh, with Studio Gang has been, she's come to us saying she really likes and supports the work we do, and we say, well, here's how you could really support us, and um, uh, the, the, the studio has been intensely responsive on that. Uh, I think uh, SOM on the Great Lakes stuff has been similarly 
forward leaning in terms of this is a function that is mission driven. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the larger issues in relation to, uh, let's say, the disciplines around design is that uh, they haven't been brought to the table often enough. You know, uh, engineering is always there uh, in relation to policy and regulation, uh, but design, we're often talking to ourselves. Uh, and so part of the question is how, how we develop interdisciplinary collaborations that can actually move larger agendas forward. Uh, I wanted to touch on sort of another piece of this when we talk about sort of the lar natural logics and some of the uh, differences or distinctions between uh, fluid logics, especially in relation to water, and uh, the cultural logics of uh, uh, discretizing uh, land so that it's all about private ownership, parcelization. I mean, uh, I was dealing with many of the issues in relation to the Mississippi, and of course, some of the largest blockages to any kind of environmental response was the issue of land ownership. Uh, in the LA panel, you know, it was about sort of jurisdiction or ownership in relation to water. And, uh, and I very much appreciated uh, your um, sort of map of the mapping of hydrological uh, boundaries and districts onto political boundaries. How, how do you see that moving forward beyond it being something that's educational? Is there, is there a way to, to start to think this uh, through a larger territory or understand it in a, in a different way? I, I think in our case, um, Maybe for better or for worse, the, the issue of vacancy in Detroit, uh, you know, has a lot of challenges associated with it, and we're not the only city. There's a lot of cities that have this challenge. Um, but part of what's come out of that is a real um, intensive conversation about are there other opportunities in thinking about um, parcelization in different ways as we start to look for opportunities for aggregation or other kinds of things. Um, that are coming out of um, the issue of vacancy. And just in terms of data, there's been a tremendous amount of work done in identifying who owns what and trying to facilitate um, changes in ownership or right. aggregation and so on. So in a pragmatic way, um, even though it wasn't specifically about water, it has opened up opportunities in terms of these other issues that we're talking about. And um, I, I don't know <laughs> what will happen as we move forward after all of our bankruptcy proceedings. Um, but the other thing that's come out of, out of the financial stress is a real conversation about um, of issues of ownership and responsibility. And you know, part of the, the struggle, at least in the case of Detroit, with implementing green infrastructure has to do with, um, uh, with the legal frameworks that the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department is legally the ones who has to then report back to the EPA for all the failures and be the ones who have to lead in the charge of cleaning up the problem. Um, but as you saw, they're not really, it's the whole region that's contributing to the problem. So it's, it's a strange thing to then have only one party accountable and responsible and a party that happens to have a very strong um, engineering background, but not necessarily a diverse um, background in terms of different disciplines coming to the table. So there, I think that mismatch um, has the potential to be challenged a little bit as all the restructuring and, and conversations about um, what parts of the system more generally are working and broken um, move forward as well. How do you, how do you deal with uh, some of the financial challenges, uh, let's say not having the tax base in uh, Detroit? And, I'm, and mm -hmm. again, I think back you know, to uh, some of the things I was dealing with in New Orleans where uh, there was so much blighted and abandoned properties and these were being expropriated uh, by the city, but then the city became the largest landowner of blighted and, and, exp you know, and blighted properties and had no funds to actually do anything with it. You know? um, so what's the, how do you deal with the kind of financial challenges that are part of that, uh, that context as well? I don't have the answer, but I was sold by Peter's napkin calculations in the previous <laughs> panel. Um, yeah. And I think some of that way of thinking of coupling opportunities and really changing what we think is expensive and what that expense is contributing to um, would reveal many more opportunities than we think we can afford right now. 
In, in the case of Detroit, it's interesting because um, a very important part of the oh. a very important part of the uh, federal funds that are coming to uh, the cities to help neighborhoods to stabilize, mm -hmm. they are being used to pretty much demolish. Uh, that's yeah. that's uh, the way in which uh, things are equating right now. So, um, what is um, what is a real problem? Because you you are using those funds to, uh, in a way, um, clean the ground. Um, at the same time, what we are seeing is uh, um, that there are interesting partnerships emerging. So, one of the larger projects uh, dealing with green infrastructure in the city right now is a project that is. Um, Providing uh, the Kresge Foundations, one of the foundations operating in the city, is matching um, federal dollars to move forward a project in which there are many, many different parties uh, operating. Um, of course, the city has no money, but it's providing some uh, some capacity. I mean, it's operating, providing the ground, right? They they are bringing the parcels to the table. Then we have the greening of Detroit that is a nonprofit that is pretty much invested in planting trees. That's their mission. That's the way in which they are participating on larger conversations about environmental stewardship in the city. And then there are a good group of local um, associations that are also bringing their knowledge of their area and their knowledge of how the different residents can participate. And then there is a good number of uh, academic institutions that are in a way bringing their expertise. They are the ones that are gonna be bringing um, some research capacity to use this project as a way of uh, learning about. So these are some of the things that we are starting to see. There is, uh, there is never enough money, but there is a real desire because uh, many different parties are finding opportunities in coming together and start developing mm -hmm. projects that may benefit to many, many people. But of course, this is happening in a pretty large area of the city that at the same is nothing in a city that contains itself. We didn't share the diagram, but you can see uh, New York, San Francisco, and Boston all together in the perimeter of the city of Detroit. So it's a tremendous uh, geography. So everything is really small, but we are seeing little by little how different neighborhoods are starting to, to impact, even in the scarcity of, uh, of resources. I, I think that there is a requirement to, uh, to defragment these activities. Uh, green infrastructure is not simply about water or about land. It is about energy, as we we're talking about. Um, it is, uh, uh, HUD has a challenge grant out at present about resiliency that is part of the president's plan on climate change. And, and it's related to mitigation and adaptation. It's a both and. And as you deploy green infrastructure, you're doing a number of things like reducing energy demand. Uh, these things have to be knit together. That's why Kresge is putting a lot of money into this, a whole range of, there's a transformation in the uh, philanthropy community in terms of looking at these things as deeply integrated. So uh, I think part of the role that's moving forward, and I think this is something that the design community can participate in, is how you embody this, so that these are functions of the built environment and the, the environment around where the buildings are uh, in terms of, of making them function better and to have designs that actually are uh, sort of portals into uh, broader engagement for how you knit these various pieces together and they're not just separate pieces of land, water, energy, it's the built environment affecting all of the above. I'm seeing Rosalie <laughs> encroaching, so I'm assuming. Should we wrap up? Yes. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, if I can uh, sort of put, put two more things out there and uh, maybe I can continue to discussion later. Um, I guess one of, one of the things that I think is always prevalent, especially within the design community, is putting forward uh, visions that are sort of fixed and final products. You know, and when we, we deal a lot with process and we deal a lot with mapping information and mapping our own processes without necessarily mapping the processes necessary for implementation in relation to time frames, uh, the energy that's required, the funding that's required, and all the steps and negotiations that would be necessary to make a project happen. And that, that piece is often left off the table, but I feel like um, we're at the point in relation to a number of these issues where so much is about implementation and moving forward that 
uh, bringing those back into the projects themselves, I think, is a sort of critical piece. And the other is a sort of uh, open-ended question around this notion of green economy, or green and blue economy, that, uh, you know, is it a transformation of capitalism, or is it, uh, what are the things that might run counter to it? And I'm saying this, you know, if the notion of capitalism is based on certain ideas of ownership, the production of surplus, and that it's based on a condition of overconsumption that would somehow run counter to the notion of conservation. And we, of course, embrace green economies as if this will just sort of continue, that the sort of business as usual, that it won't in some way impede our notion of overconsumption. Uh, how do we deal with, with that as a kind of uh, concept? I mean, I'd, I'd, like, uh, I'd, I'd like to know sort of what each of your sort of images or understanding of what are the key constituencies and ingredients of a green economy are. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> sorry. Oh, we're at 416. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Maybe, well, maybe, we could, maybe we could just leave that as an open-ended question and come back. Yeah.